All right. So it's right at eight o'clock. So, you know, I want to welcome everyone to the session on municipal and industrial water supply. Um, hopefully everyone is used to the Zoom etiquette at this point. If you're not presenting, we will ask you to uh, be sure and mute yourself and turn off your video for the purpose of bandwidth. Um, so you all are full participants in this session. And if you have questions, please start entering those in the chat feature. So at the end of the presentation, um, the presenters will answer any questions that you may have. So I would ask you to hold your questions until the end of the presentations. Um, and um, I think before we came into the chat room, or before we came into the breakout room, there was a chat link. If you need PDH hours, uh, then you can uh, click on that link in the main chat to get um, to get lined up with uh, getting credit for participating in the session. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, our first speaker. The first session is finding additional sources of supply, the Arc City story. And the main presenter is gonna be uh, Daniel Clement. Daniel works as a hydrologist for Burns McDonald. They're located in Wichita, Kansas, where he has provided water supply solutions and water rights consulting services for over 11 years. He has a unique knowledge of the regulatory framework and permitting challenges that are associated with water rights in Kansas and the surrounding states. He has provided hydraulic, hydrologic and water rights consulting services for projects that address some of the most complex water issues in the state, including groundwater and surface water, interaction studies, remediation projects, water transfers, aquifer sustainability studies, aquifer storage and recovery programs. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. I appreciate it. And uh, with me this morning as well, as some of you heard is um, Rod Philo. Rod's been with the city for, for a long time and, and he's here to support with, with any questions you guys might have about um, a little bit of their processes and demand and how they came to settle on reverse osmosis water treatment and uh, some of their uh, historic water supply issues. So uh, appreciate the introduction and, and let's talk right into it. Uh, let's take a quick safety moment. Um, we're coming up on the holidays, if, if you can find a turkey. Um, you know, just one of the things we always talk about at Burns and Mac is safety and just, just stepping back for a moment to make sure you, you know, you're safe over the holidays. Um, you know, one of the favorite things to do at our house is cook just like many households on Thanksgiving. So, uh, with that coming up, let's make sure we cook the turkey and not the house. Um, just be careful when you're cooking, be cognizant of what you're doing, especially with small children, that sort of thing, and try and keep things away from the stove if they're not being cooked and just, uh, be cognizant of when you're cooking, stay safe this Thanksgiving break. So we're going to talk about a few things this morning. Um, this is really kind of just a, a story about Arc City and how um, they evolved to replace ultimately what was a pretty darn aged water treatment plant. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about those water treatment plant improvements. And just like many communities, they're experiencing some growth and uh, primarily on the industrial side. And so you want those folks to stick around and you want you know new businesses to move. And so how are you going to deal with that? And that that ultimately involved uh, some water rights permitting to go along with those water treatment plan improvements. And so we're just gonna talk a little bit about how we dealt with that. And this is really their, their story. Um, and then lastly, just water resources management as a whole uh, within the state, just some um, ways that we dealt with this project and DWR's willingness to work with us on it, I think really sets a, a nice example of how, how the state can uh, look at some other alternatives um, for other municipalities. So a little background on uh, Park City and where they get their water supply from. Um, they have 10 wells adjacent to the Arkansas River. Uh, those are completed in the Arkansas River alluvium. Um, previously, prior to some of the reverse osmosis water treatment plant improvements, uh, the water treatment plant that was there had been in operation since the 1900s. And um, as you can imagine, anything that's been in operation since the 1900s um, goes along with a lot of maintenance. And uh, Arc City was starting to see uh, rising water demands and uh, the maintenance associated with that facility was really just outpacing the value uh, of moving to something new long-term. 
And then also the treatment processes that were at that water treatment plant, not unlike many municipalities. Um, again, older technology. Um, we have obviously some, some dynamic water quality regulation changes that continue to happen. And so dealing with those wasn't going to be able to happen with that older water treatment plant. Um, so ultimately, uh, that led to Burns and Mac and uh, Arc City uh, constructing a, a new 5.4 MGD uh, green sand uh, and RO uh, water treatment plant. And so along with that, uh, we were able to reclassify uh, their wells, their 10 wells in the Arkansas River, or Luvium as groundwater and not groundwater under the influence. Uh, for those of you that aren't water treatment people, there's sort of three classifications of, of water treatment out there. There's groundwater, and that's a lot of the communities in the state are on that simple uh, pump and maybe chlorinate and then send that into distribution for drinking water. There's surface water, there's more treatment uh, requirements that go along with uh, pumping surface water and treating it in general. And then there's groundwater under the influence, which is sort of maybe you have a well right next to the river, or maybe you have a horizontal collector well, where you start to see some of those same signatures as you do in surface water. Um, but we ultimately were able to reclassify um, that groundwater as not being under groundwater the influence, even though it was pre previously classified as groundwater under the influence by KDHE. And so that, that led to some water treatment plant savings, but uh, we'll talk about how that kind of tied into some of the water rights issues here in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that happened when we were building the water treatment plant um, is we found that in the history of uh, Arc City's water use, um, they were really right up against the wall already with, with their existing water rights. So this is just a map on the right side here. Um, here's Highway 166 to the south and Arc City's well field is, is basically distributed about, uh, this is about a mile. Uh, here's the Arc, Ant, Arc River, and then uh, the wells are just offset, and these are placed basically in ideal locations where um, the depth of bedrock is, is the deepest, uh, just to achieve the, the highest yield possible for those wells. Um, they're roughly 600 to 2300 feet from the river, just in general. Again, those were historically, prior to building the RO water treatment plant, classified as groundwater and the influence. Uh, we will, were able to, um, with some help from KDHE and some additional testing and coordination, uh, classify those as groundwater, uh, ultimately leading to a, a little bit easier treatment um, for the RO water treatment plant. So with that background on where the wells are at, um, just to give you a little bit of overview of the water treatment plant, uh, again, 5.4 million gallons a day and it's green sand plus RO. Uh, the things we're primarily trying to treat are uh, donated from the river, uh, and that's going to be manganese, uh, chlorides, hardness, and TDS. Again, some of those things you just can't attack with you know, the, the treatment that they had since the 1900s. So this more conventional treatment, our own green sand, takes care of that. Um, and one of the drivers for that, and Rod can probably speak to it, is that you know, higher, higher treated water quality uh, helps grow and support some of those industrial demands. Um, when you're supplying to those critical industrial customers, they don't have to treat as much at their facility, so their costs go down. Uh, and then you also can bring in uh, new, uh, new industrial users, and that just promotes growth overall in the city. So, um, but one of the things with RO that impacts your raw water supply and your water rights is that um, up to 20% uh, of that uh, water that goes through reverse osmosis, you generate a waste stream. And so realistically, you can anticipate up to a 20% boost in your raw water supply needs. And so that's what we were gonna deal with. Um, kind of a high overview of uh, their water rights. They have a vested water right. They also have another water right that basically adds up to roughly 1,200 million gallons a year. Uh, for those of you that live in acre feet, uh, that's a little under 4,000 acre feet per year. Uh, in their history already, uh, Arc City had seen years, especially during drought, where they were bumping up against 1,100 or 1,100 million gallons a year. And so we saw immediately that they were going to need some additional water supply, especially accounting for that 20% loss in RO. And so how do you deal with that? And so that's kind of the next piece of the puzzle. How are we going to get uh, not only existing water supply uh, boosted, but how are we going to meet projected demands uh, through 2040 that were on the order of, you know, over 2,000 million gallons a year. So that kind of led to a search for new water rights. Um, and one of the first things we looked at, is there any new 
uh, available groundwater from their existing 10 wells. And the availability of that groundwater is managed by DWR, of course. And the applicable regulation for that uh, primarily is safe yield. Um, in this case, it's KAR 5311. And uh, for those of you not familiar with how safe yield works, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, DWR is gonna draw a two mile circle around your proposed well site. And they total up all of the other appropriations, meaning all of the other permitted wells in that area. And then uh, from that, you get a total amount of appropriations. And then DWR also has a recharge number that they apply to that two mile radius. And so if your appropriations, your total wells pumping groundwater out is greater than the amount of recharge to the system, then DWR would not issue a new water, right? Well, and that's the city's water rights alone within that two mile area had already basically made the, their own well field over appropriated. And so um, the opportunity to file, just simply file a new water right wasn't, wasn't gonna work. And so then we said, well, what, what other alternatives can we do? Are there other areas in uh, particularly in the alluvium that we can, we can find? Basically outside the Arkansas River alluvium, there's just not much for alternatives. So could we go to the North, could we go to the South? And what we found in, in our exploration was it just really wasn't that much aquifer saturated thickness or where there were, we were talking about depths of wells of, you know, on the order of 35 feet, which would have got us back into that groundwater under the influence potential classification. So ultimately, um, really just coming off the capital costs of that new water treatment plant, um, we would have had some pretty significant rate impacts too from having to go do a new well field. So we started looking pretty heavily on, you know, what's the availability really uh, within the existing well field? Is there really something there? And, and I remember Rod and us uh, sitting down and, and talking through it. And we looked at it and said, you know, Rod, have you ever had any sustainability issues in your well field? And the answer was no. And it's, we started comparing water levels with uh, river levels and said, you know, this is really a pretty good hydraulic connection with the river here. We don't think you could ever pump this dry. And so we said, really, what's the next step? And so in some discussions with DWR, we looked at this concept of induced infiltration, and this is done in other places of the state, even though it's not a strict application of safe yield. Well, what's the opportunity to look at? You know, when we pump a well, we obviously get groundwater, right? There's some portion that's groundwater, and then there's this other portion that's surface water, you know, induced infiltration from the, the stream here to, to leverage that hydraulic connection. So we looked at this as an opportunity to basically file new water rights supported by this induced infiltration quantity. Um, and this isn't a new concept in the state. DWR already uses this uh, on the Missouri River. Um, one of the methods they use is the Jenkins method. And then for horizontal collector well permits, um, basically you get a permit for groundwater and you get a permit for uh, surface water. And those, those permit numbers are sequential. And so when DWR um, and, and Burns and Mac and the city first sat down, DWR was like, well, you're really gonna have to prove to us that, you know, what's the quantification of that, that interaction? So one of the first things we looked at then is, you know, how much water is really available? And down in Arc City, the river's got lots of flow. Um, you know, if we looked at the, this is just an exceedance map. And so basically percentage of the time indicated uh, that the value was you know, exceeded the 99% exceedance, in other words, we can go out there 99% of the time, we'd see a flow of 60 CFS right through the well field of at least 38 MGD. And really what we're looking for is roughly around six. So there's lots of water available at least 99% of the time. So plenty of water available even during dry periods. And so for us, this made sense to keep going. Um, so that led to a hydrogeologic study to sort of, you know, put our money where our mouth was on what the interaction amount was. Uh, this gets a little bit into the weeds on, on how that works, but and when you pump a well, you get a cone of depression, right? Uh, well, the river acts as a recharge boundary. And so again, we're inducing that, that hydraulic connection here. Uh, and that gets into what we call image well theory, and, and we can quantify Right. If we have a queue here, if we have a flux, if we have a pumping amount coming out, we can sort of figure out by um, some mathematical processes how much of that's coming from the, the river. And so we knew just by uh, water level measurements from the past, a large amount was going to come from uh, the river. And then we did some extended pump testing to de define some aquifer parameters being transmissivity, the storage parameters of the aquifer, and then A, which is um, 
line source distance to uh, the recharge boundary. Same effort you would probably go through for a horizontal collector well. Um, same similar process up in the Missouri River. So, um, so we monitored river stage changes, we installed a bunch of piezometers, and we also, also installed a sand point in the riverbed. This is kind of what that looks like. You end up with uh, monitoring wells that are parallel and perpendicular to the river. And we also have a sand point. And the nice thing here is we have a river gauge that's just downstream uh, where we can monitor those relative changes in, in, in river gauge height. Uh, the results of that inf investigation were basically that 62% of the water produced from the well field is sourced from induced infiltration. Uh, so our thoughts were basically we could use that if DWR has already got uh, 1,264 million gallons a year of existing groundwater rights, that allows for leveraging that groundwater right to induce you know, the additional water uh, that's available from the ORC. And that results in a total uh, potential appropriation of over 3,000 million gallons a year. So from a groundwater component, again, the way you do the math there, groundwater being 1,264, uh, basically the, the total amount of that 62% ratio would be over 2,000 million a year gallons a year. So the city filed new applications supported by this induced infiltration concept uh, for a little over 2,000 million gallons a year. So the results of that is basically you, we applied and, and received an administrative change with, with no capital investment um, for over 2,000 million gallons a year. Um, you know, coming right off, you know, the installation and, and construction and, and operation of a new water treatment plant. This was a, a a fantastic win for the ratepayers of Arc City. Uh, no new infrastructure and really uh, the same sustainability of their well field. Um, and again, it met projected water demands that we were looking for all the way through 2060 with this with this water right application. And this is just sort of um, again talking long term in other places in the state. Uh, this is a little bit unique in that obviously the river is flowing and flowing plenty uh, down by Arc City. Uh, Arc City in this instance was sort of the only user in the zone uh, that we were talking about for, uh, for pumping. There weren't any other nearbys. Um, but if we had been bound to conventional safe yield here, if, if, if the regulations were so rigid that you know, we weren't even allowed to look at this, then it would have been at a loss to not only Arc City, um, but really the state as a whole. That, that water that was essentially available would have continued to flow right by down to Oklahoma um, without being put to economic benefit. Uh, here in the state. And so I guess the takeaway is just if there's flexibility in permitting and it's supported by good science, um, good solid groundwater and surface water studies, uh, groundwater modeling, and you know, I would just encourage uh, the state to continue to uh, allow for these types of projects that are just supported by good science. So with that, um, I think Rod and I would take any questions on, on sort of the story. All right, great job, Daniel. Um, does anyone have any questions for Daniel or Rod? If you do, you can type them in the chat or you can turn on your audio. Daniel, I have a couple of questions if no one has any questions. I, I think, I thought I heard you earlier say that your goal was to avoid reclassifying the source as groundwater under the influence. And so when you ended up with 62% of the water being attributed to surface water, were you able to achieve that goal? Yeah, we were. Um, and as, as the cities redrilled wells too, and that's, that was another issue is some of these wells were just extremely old. Um, we ended up with better well completions um, and Rod could probably speak to that. But each one of these wells has, um, as they are redrilled, has gone, uh, gone through MPA testing. And so really it's the hydraulic connection and, this gets into the weeds a little bit about groundwater, the influence, but you can still have a hydraulic connection and not see the surface water signatures. In other words, the, the wild swings in, in temperature and PDS, and particularly, you know, the, the viruses and bacteria that are an issue with being under the influence. And so this is really about the hydraulic connection, not necessarily the um, the groundwater under the influence signatures, if that makes sense, because the microparticulate analysis and some of the other data supports um, that these are not under the influence, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you did, when they put in new wells, then you put them closer to the river, basically. No, in, in this instance, uh, the, the wells are actually offset in the same uh, similar locations. Um, even though they are at a pretty good distance, a lot of these if I can get back to that slide. Um, 
when Rod redrills wells, and he can probably speak to it, uh, you know, these are these are basically offset and drilled in the same location. So any of the existing wells that we had, we basically ran through this analysis um, for each one of these based on the distance to the river to figure out what that ratio was, because your your ratio can change depending on how close you are. But for the city, these wells are already drilled in basically optimal locations in the, the aquifer where the aquifer is deepest. And so moving closer to the river doesn't necessarily get you a, a higher yield. Um, and so in a lot of these cases, these wells are located where, where they are for um, the highest yield purpose, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the conditions already exist and you just got it reclassified with BWR. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, question from Mary Hill. In areas where surface water rights are an issue, how would completion at lower flows be handled? That's probably a great question uh, for DWR. Um, you know, there are periods then where we could figure out um, probably through flow analysis, let's say, let's say you had really great flows available in the spring and, you know, maybe not so much in the summer. That might be typical, um, but would probably be figuring out how you could operate your well field, maybe at what rates, and then how your water right might be limited in, in years where either MDS or there's another driver that would be you know, limiting uh, your ability to appropriate that water or use it in a given year. Um, and we looked at that, and this is a little unique just because the Arc River has such a high exceedance flow. Remember, we've got plenty of water available um, most of the time. Okay. Um, and then Brad Barton has a question. Has there been any issues with Oklahoma in the Caw Reservoir downstream? Uh, not that I know of. Um, as far as I know, all the conversations with Oklahoma have been good, but that'd be a great question for DWR. All right. Uh, let's see, there's an add-on. And just curious, are there any flooding issues in the well field? There are. Um, the wells are, are built up. Um, the completions are, are made to be well, up, well above any, any flooding issues, um, but we still have not seen any any issues from that. So um, all the well completions are, are well and ready for uh, ready for events like that. All right. Just I'm curious, what, what level do you build to? Is it a hundred year, 500 year? Uh, I don't remember off, I mean, at a minimum 100 in this instance here, um, but it depends on the type of well completion. I think Rod could probably speak to it, but I think when they're recompleting wells, they're still using mounds out there. It just depends on the elevation and, and, and how we do a well completion, but at a minimum, it would be 100. Yeah, there we go to the 100 year flood level, like a foot or two above that. All right, good deal. Any other questions for Daniel or Rod? All right, well, appreciate the presentation. Great job. Um, if there's any other questions, I think you can probably get a hold of them through their email addresses. So uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, presenter. Um, and I'm not sure if it's going to be John uh, called Clazer or whether it's going to be Brian. Um, it looks like it looks like John is the co-presenter. So I guess he's going to at least run the slides, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Okay. We're going to co-present. This is Brian. And yeah, I'm always john's much better with the technology so he's all right hey, well, I, have brian's, I have brian's bio so brian you can introduce uh, john <laughs> so uh, brian joined the environmental finance center at wichita state university as a program manager in 2018 he has more than 25 years of experience with federal and state fish and wildlife agencies and he has extensive experience with federal grants and financial assistance programs both as a grantor and a grant recipient. Brian had received his PhD in wildlife and fishery science from Texas A&M University and completed his master's of science in zoology from Oklahoma State University. He received his bachelor of science in biology from Fort Hayes State University and he is a native of Topeka, Kansas. So Brian, I'll let you introduce John. Thanks, and John, you can correct me, but yeah, so uh, Mike, we're co-presenting. John's a, a, a program manager, recently promoted a program manager here at Wichita State's Environmental Finance Center as well. He's a native 
of uh, Greensburg, if I'm remembering right. Got, uh, he got his, ma his uh, bachelor's at Fort Hayes State, like myself, we're both Tigers. Uh, and he's in the process of completing his MPA uh, at Wichita State with the Hugo Wall School. Great, he's a great, great resource and uh, he'll be presenting about, about half of this presentation. So, so with that, um, we thank everybody. We're, we appreciate the opportunity to, to, uh, to inform you about the commu uh, Kansas Community Sustainability Tool. You may have heard about it already, but we uh, are just continuing to want to share the information about it. And we think it's a great resource for you all. And we just want to make sure you guys know about it. John, go on. So if you are if you haven't heard about us or if you're not real familiar with us, we are the Environmental Finance Center, Wichita State University Environmental Finance Center. Uh, uh, as a longtime government employee, I think it's pretty neat. EPA has stood up an environmental finance center in each of their regions and uh, environmental finance centers can offer because of this designation we can offer a bunch of different technical assistance on a wide range of topics uh, we at wichita state were known for asset management and some of our work with public utilities but uh, it's a neat resource it's a neat program if you aren't aware of us uh, look us up on our website and we probably thanks to our funding from epa and KDHE and others, we might be able to provide you some, some technical assistance. So neat, neat, neat program at the national level. Today's presentation is on the Kansas Community uh, Sustainability Tool. It's a it's a excellent resource. This is the team that worked on it with updating the tool. We recently, if you guys are aware of it, uh, we actually released the tool first in 2019. Uh, EPA is very supportive of it and gave us an additional funding to go on and update it uh with more recent census data so this is the team that worked on it dr rowan shin up on the left john cole Clazers on the right uh michelle de haven on the lower left myself in the middle and then dr uh dr wong Xiaohang wong on the right on the lower right so that's our team we uh, we've got it we worked quite a bit with uh with our updating the program and and worked out some kinks we we think we got a great a great thing a great resource for you so what this program does is it assesses it assesses the sustainability of water and wastewater infrastructure investments using the forecasted median household income for communities. The term sustainability, we really prefer to use the term affordability. Uh, if we think that makes more sense, but there's a long history as to why it's called the sustainability tool. We encourage you to think of it as affordability and it's a great resource, a planning resource to see what's going on in communities and whether they can afford investments in their water infrastructure. Um, it does use the tool, uses the EPA guidelines at two and a half percent, that the uh, water rates or water bills should not exceed two and a half percent for the drinking water, nor 2% of the median household income for the uh, wastewater. Uh, the core of the tool is Excel based. And the, when we initially released it back in 2019, that's only what uh, was available. Thanks to EPA's funding, we have been able to uh, make it, bring it online. And that's the part that John's gonna uh, talk about largely, but it's a, it's a neat program. It is state specific. It uses uh, information from the census uh, and to make projections on the median household income in the future for communities. In Kansas's case, I think we have, it's all the, it's all the communities that are available from the American Community Survey. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the tune of 660, if I'm remembering right. Uh, communities are available and it's a real neat resource. It, uh, if you get into the crux of it, it's gonna project the median household income for those communities into the future, as well as their population and some other, uh, other, other variables. Next slide, John. What can the tool do? This is one of the things that we, uh, we realized initially, we really got into this at, uh, during our update process. The tool, there's a lot of things that folks think it can do, and we realized throughout time that it, what, uh, some of its restrictions. So it's, the tool is great for planning future, in, in, uh, future infrastructure investment. Uh, it, if you can use it easily to evaluate if the town or if the community can afford the current rates uh, and with the added on cost of loan repayments. Uh, it's, we, it is designed to handle both water and wastewater uh, investments, and it's real easy to run, particularly now it's on the web, you can run different scenarios. If you got some options, some construction op options or funding options, that's real easy. You just need a few inputs. Uh, you can run it and get printouts. Um, what it doesn't do, you know, there are limitations. You can't use it necessarily to justify your existing water and wastewater rates. If you know much about us uh, at the EFC, we're out, uh, thanks to KDHE funding, we're out 
public leading training on uh, on utility on water uh, water bills and water rates. So it, you know the tool is not good for that. You need a much more detailed analysis to determine whether or not your existing uh, water and wastewater rates are are uh, um, a current or acceptable. Uh, it doesn't look at all in things like reserve account. Uh, and the one thing it doesn't do, if, you know, a lot of your communities may have different water rates by rate, maybe a commercial uh, a commercial charge versus a residential. This program only looks at, it only considers one rate, which would be like a residential rate, uh, where it doesn't really have the ability to separate in between commercial and residential. So with that, uh, John, I think you're going to take over from here. Yeah. <clears throat> so what the tool takes in the information that it requires from the user who is um, um, using the tool is the average water and wastewater bill. Brian was just kind of talking on that, how it doesn't differentiate between the different classes of customer, but you insert your average water and wastewater bill. And what the tool will do is show you the increase that your water bill would need to absorb whatever the planned capital improvement would be, how much you're financing. Um, and then the term of that, and then that adds that to your water bill. Um, and so, and then also the average growth rate of your water and wastewater bill, working with small communities, you find that sometimes those communities haven't increased their water rates um, for, for decades at a time. Uh, uh, you know, that's not uh, common everywhere, uh, but you do run into that occasionally. Um, so if you're wanting you know, some people have it built into their ordinance, a 2% increase every single year, 3%. Um, you can plug that in and then it'll show you over time as your water and wastewater bill would increase with that rate of inflation. Uh, and then the cost of water and wastewater infrastructure to be financed, the number of years of the loan, and then that loan interest rate. And this helps you determine um, kind of what is that, that payment um, schedule going to look like. So um, this is kind of the tool uh, logic model. Um, so it's based entirely on census data we pull from the five-year estimates produced by the American Community Survey. Um, there are 619 cities that we look at in the state of Kansas. There are more within the American Community Survey, but um, due to missing data for some cities and some years, um, incredibly low population cities, um, we're not able to, to pull that, that information consistently, so we have to remove those from the data set. <clears throat> Uh, it uses a regression modeling uh, technique to produce those forecasts and assessments. Um, so we do a fixed um, fixed effects panel data regression. Um, and then the results are, are, are presented in kind of uh, a, a stoplight way. Um, so red um, is, is that your rates are probably going to be unaffordable for your communities, um, depending on the, the, the growth rate for your bills plus um, what you're financing. Yellow means there's a moderate risk that they're going to be unaffordable for your population. And then green means that there's a fairly low chance below um, that 33% threshold. So some historical predictor variables that we use, this is what we pull from EACS is population, um, educational attainment. So this is for both bachelor's degree and high school education, and then present of jobs in manufacturing. Uh, and then probably the most important over here, I probably can't see my mouse, but the, that historical household income um, is, is one of the most important. What predicts our median household income the best is that historical income. Uh, and we plug that into our statistical model. Um, it produces our coefficients, the importance of each one of those variables. And then we create a, a uh, city specific. Um, and eventually that all, all comes together, um, not to get two into it, uh, comes together and produces the tool as you can see it. Uh, so we have the tool demonstration. Uh, we weren't sure on what kind of internet connection we were going to have today. So we pulled uh, screen grabs. Um, we will drop the link for um, our, our website, which includes the link to the online tool. This is also available in the Excel format. Um, in there, you can pull all of our data sheets. You can pull our coefficients. You can pull our city specific constants, um, as well as that ACS data that, that we are using to support um, the, the tool. Um, so currently online, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, and Iowa. Um, obviously, we're, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, Kansas today. Um, so up there, you select your community, the community that you're, you're wanting to look at, um, and then you can plug in all of that information that you have. Um, one thing that we've been um, 
doing it is finding the different ways that the tool can be used um, in addition to assessing that infrastructure investment. Uh, and one way is to you know, plug in what that average monthly household drinking bill is and nothing else. And that can produce for us, where is that community at today in terms of affordability? Um, and then from there, we can kind of have that conversation of what does the capacity for that community to take on future financing look like? Uh, but as mentioned earlier, and then um, if you don't have an annual interest rate, this is the question that I think comes up the most, um, is you can use the default rate, which is on a curve. Um, so the, the, the shorter the loan term, the, the higher the rate would be, um, and the longer you go out, um, that, that percent interest rate goes down, but obviously you're financing it for a longer period of time. <clears throat> so this is kind of what we were talking about earlier, the, the stoplight up here in the top right where it's low. This uh, would be what, what are the odds that this line here exceeds what are our forecasted median household income is going to be. Um, and as you can see here, it, it's below that 33% threshold on statistical um, significance. But it also shows what our current median household income is today. And so for this, it's the four, first forecasted year. So 2021, next year, we'll, we'll kick it out to 2022, and then hopefully be updating the data set with the new ACS data for 2020 and 2021. Um, hey, John, hey, John, if I can interrupt just a little bit. So what you're seeing on yeah, the bottom of, of the graph uh, is the blue line is what the projected median household income is out into the future years. What we call, what you see the shaded area, we call it internally, we call it the cone. Uh, that is the kind of the confidence intervals or what the median household income is likely to, the range it's likely to be. But the projected is that blue line. Uh, and then the red line down below is where the, the water, what your water bill payments are. So. Keep going, yeah, John. Thank I, you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for adding that. And as you go out, you can see that um, our, our certainty um, decreases with time on, on what those rates will be. And as we build the data set larger, we're hopeful that we can start to bring in that cone and then find other variables to build in to our forecast. Um, but here you have your current bill. So the average water rate that was input was $40. And as you can see, to absorb that, um, you would need to increase your average water rate by $9.88. So what uh, we, we talked about earlier in terms of rate sufficiency. So sometimes your rates don't need to be increased in order to take on a new loan. Um, so, so that's where we talk about, it doesn't determine your rate sufficiency. So maybe you need to increase your rates more than $9.88. And sometimes um, maybe you don't have to increase them at all. But this is just showing if you wanted to keep your current levels of, of revenues, this is how much you would need to increase it. So that, that's the way that you should be thinking about that projected bill compared to the current. And then we show all the way down um, into the future, uh, you know, what is that forecasted median household income with our increased water bill? Uh, and as well as our, our rate increase, I think that whenever we built this, we did it at 2%. And as you can see here, the loan drops off in 2041. So I think that we did a 20 year loan. Um, and then that returns back to that, whatever increase of, uh, at I believe 2% per year. Um, and then it shows you that percent per median household income. Um, so there, this link uh, should have been dropped into the chat. You can find more information about the community sustainability tool there. Uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to um, myself or, or, or Brian. Uh, we'd be happy to help you um, work through the tool. And we're also you know, always looking for feedback on how the tool can be improved. Uh, I think that's our time. So I really appreciate everybody's um, time this morning. Um, great presentations. Uh, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful event. So uh, great. Um, appreciate the presentation, John and Brian. Uh, I know you guys need to run. Are there any quick questions for uh, these guys? Yeah, I had one. I had one quick question. Um, it seems like one of the things that is a trend in the industry is uh, moving away from the use of the median household income 
and moving more towards um, an affordability ratio. Um, does your tool have any flexibility for using a different metric versus um, the median household income? Yeah, so I can hop in on that real fast. One of our colleagues who um, was on kind of that, that initial slide where we introduced the team, Michelle DeHaven, she's worked a lot recently on different affordability metrics and they looked at six. I'm not gonna try to pull all six off the top of my head right now in partnerships with other environmental finance centers. Um, and so in future versions of the tool, we're going to look into incorporating those in so that there's more than just that one metric you know, those six metrics that they found through their research to be important for affordability, you'll be able to um, get more information out of it. Okay, great. Thank you. Good job, yeah. guys. Appreciate Thank your you. time. All right. Uh, so next step, um, the presentation is uh, from the Kansas Water Office and Kansas Rural Water Association, a partnership for Kansas Drinking Water Suppliers, and our presenters are Darren Martin and Jason Solomon. So Darren is a technical assistant for uh, the Rural Water Association. He was previously with the environmental program um, for water and wastewater programs in KDHE South Central District Office in Wichita and he was a surface water treatment plant operator in El Dorado for five years and holds a class four water operator's license. Jason uh, is a wastewater tech for the association and prior to joining uh, the Rural Water Association, he was a staff um, um, uh, for 10 years at KDHE where he was the district environmental administrator for the Southwest district office in Chanute, and he also worked in uh, the Northeast district office in Lawrence. So with that, I'll turn it over to Darren and Jason. Can you guys hear us okay? Can see us? Yep. Yep. We can see you here. I see a lot of familiar names on the list, so a lot of my KDG friends, I wish we could see each other, but uh, maybe someday again. So we are going to discuss Kansas Water Office and Kansas Rural Water Partnership for Drinking Water Suppliers. <clears throat> a little history on Kansas Rural Water Association. So that's our mission statement is to um, provide the education and leadership necessary to enhance the effect effectiveness of Kansas's water and wastewater utilities. KRWA was formed in 1965 um, as a result of a bunch of rural water districts coming together and um, addressing the need of needing a self-help sort of uh, association that um, could go and help with technical assistance. I mean, some of the water systems that we get to work with are pretty advanced, and a lot of these small towns don't have the resources necessary um, on their own. Uh, in 1976, they renamed it the Kansas Rural Water Association because of a growing municipality um, involvement. We have a lot of small municipalities and rural water districts that are involved in our association. January 1977, they issued debut issue of the Lifeline. The Kansas Lifeline is a magazine that we put out three times a year. Um, it's a lot of good information in there, um, and we appreciate people reading it and letting us know that you read it. So um, comments are always welcome. The 53rd annual conference is scheduled for March um, 2022. So hopefully that'll be a good opportunity for everybody to get together in person. We invite everybody to come to that. So the commercial's over. <laughs> All right, KRWA and K Water Office Partnership. So the Water Office initiated water conservation plans in the late 80s because of extensive drought throughout the state. And Kansas Rural Water helped um, do a lot of training on those water conservation plans and addressing the need of water conservation, even you know, 30, 40 years ago. In 1989, the Corporation Commission contracted for water loss surveys and KRWA did that for two years, and then the program was moved to the water office in 1992, and it's been there ever since. Um, we've just released the, what is it, 40th? Yeah. They just released the 40th um, annual report for that, the 30th, I guess, 92 would be 30. <laughs> <laughs> it's early for math. Uh, the program is funded as 
a benefit of the clean drinking water fee, and that's the fee that every water system pays to the state um, in order to use the water. So the technical assistance to water users is the actual program name, um, and water office provides funding for technical assistance. So we have, what are we up to 20 staff members or so now that um, we cover the entire state and we provide the TA work. General assistance requests, that's mainly what I work on. And um, we have people that work on water conservation plans, water loss surveys, there's four or five guys that do that. And then regional public water supply activities. So a lot of the TA work is training. Um, new operators will go out and train a new operator on how to correctly do the job, um, how to you know, fix water leaks, find water leaks, um, basically anything. <laughs> So this is a graph that I took from the KDHE annual compliance report. And I don't know how many folks know this, but 835 of our water systems in Kansas. So 96% are populations less than 10,000. These small systems don't have the resources to have the advanced tools, leak detection equipment, valve turning machines. Um, we have tanks for when a system needs to take a, a elevated storage tank out of service. We have tanks that we can use um, during that time so they can maintain pressure. And so these small systems across the state, and this is across the entire state, as you can see here, there was, and my <laughs> screen is covered, so I have to use this, 167 cities and 116 water districts. And so that was the general TA assistance. And you can see these dots, um, it's spread throughout the entire state. Um, course mainly in the eastern third of the state which is where all the water systems and population are that's where our, we do a lot of our work but we go out west we cover the entire state these are water loss surveys um, so they did 168 water loss surveys uh, found 586.5 gallon per minute worth of leaks so you can see up there that's uh i can't see it because of my <laughs> screen <laughs> uh what does that come out to 1.2 million dollars worth of water saved so and that's really substantial to these small systems that are less than 10,000. and jason will give um, an account of a actual leak finding so this is the last 10 years the number of surveys that we've done and the amount of water that's been saved and so yesterday there was a lot on water conservation and how we're going to be sustainable and this leak detection program is a major part of that um this this water's already been pumped out of the ground it's already been treated all the money that is put into sending a gallon of water to my house is ending up in the ground and so this is I mean, you can see those numbers there there's a lot of money saved doing this i want to be way ahead you're gonna have to <laughs> so um Every time that we do a meter test, so this is an uh, example of a letter for a meter test. Um, these meters tested, you know, 98.7 percent accurate. This is from Jackson Rural Water Number Three. So whenever KRWA comes out and does technical assistance visits, many many times we'll do follow-up letters. All these letters are posted to the internet. There, um, we have full disclosure on everything that we do, and so. If you're interested in the kind of work that we're doing and where the money's going, um, we invite you to go to the website and look up these letters. But for example, on this one, this meter was accurate, but we'll see a lot of times. So KRWA has meters that are certified as, as accurate to test production meters like these three and six inch meters. Those are big meters. Um, and so we have those so that water systems don't have to pay for that on their own. And so, an inaccurate meter can um, cause a lot of water loss and it costs a lot of money for these systems if their metering is not accurate. So that's one of the main functions that this contract um, helps these small systems with along with leak detection, which uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Solomon here. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Darren has to do all the photos and or all the presentation. We have him do the Oh, the technical terms and all that, and I get to put pretty pictures in. So this is a this is a picture. Um, the white spot there in the middle that's my house, and I was walking back from the Vertigus River, and uh, this rainbow was over my house. And if you look over on the right hand side, um, you can see where it appears that the rainbow touches the ground. Well, I can tell you there's not a pot of gold on that side. 
Uh, I waited and tried to uh, go to the other side and see if the pot of gold was over there, but it was not. Um, and this next photo is just a photo. This is a fish that I caught out of the Verdix River. It's a nice flathead catfish. It was over 50 pounds. And Darren gets tired of me showing my pit fish pictures, so this is in here for him. Um, if everyone remembers last February, um, it was a historic event of cold weather. Um, we had extreme cold, and I didn't probably put more hours in it, KRWA, than I ever have um, during this time. There was water leaks everywhere. People were without water. We had lines that were frozen completely solid in the ground. <clears throat> See right there, yeah. um, 14, 14, 15 degrees below. Yeah, and this yeah, southeast corner from is where I'm from um, is, you know, 15 below. Uh, that's pretty darn cold. And that freezes a lot of water lines. Um, so one lake that I was working with, uh, well, this isn't the tower from it, but it looked very similar to that. Um, this is taken in Kansas. Um, was this Elk County Rural Water District 2. So what this photo is, or this uh, slide is showing is all the water lines that are covered by this district. So if you see there in the middle, there's Howard. Howard is where the water is produced for this elk rural water too. So the, all those lines are different size water lines. So um, it's approximately 30 miles um, from corner to corner in this district. And there's 300 miles of line. So when you're looking for a water leak, you've got 300 miles that you've got to cover. Um, and so the roads don't always line up exactly with where the water um, lines run. So, you know, chasing these lines down and trying to find the leak can be a very, is challenging. And I probably don't ever wanna hear again, uh, what do you mean you can't find a 30,000 gallon a day leak or 60,000? We hear that all the time. Um, and it, it is a challenge, especially when the ground was frozen. Um, any water that was probably coming out was gonna be frozen. Sometimes it would surface, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, we looked for, oh, three days for this leak. And then finally the city of Howard who was producing the water, they produce 100,000 gallons per day. And then by the end, the system was losing 60,000. So what happened is the city said, we can no longer provide you water and we're gonna shut the system completely off because they couldn't provide fire protection for their own town. So potentially all of these, all the lines that you see would have not had water in them and all the folks of, they have about 200 customers would have been without water. Um, so this is kind of some of the challenges, and these are just in general. Um, the weather was certainly a challenge last February, and the amount of miles of line to cover, and also the lack of valves. If you see, you know, you see these arms or these um, legs of the water line, if we could have had a valve to shut one off and see which direction the um, leak was even happening, it would have been very helpful, but they didn't have enough valves in order to figure out where <clears throat> where um, to, to isolate the isolate the leak or about also work or about also work <laughs> sorry that's right um, and so then some of the unexpected ones on this one was the chairman and board of directors um, they weren't real excited they didn't understand you know they just knew they had a water leak and they didn't understand until I called them and said you know they're going to cut the water off they can no longer produce and provide you water and then things got pretty darn serious. The other thing that we often run into out in the field is that the operator um, for this system, he was hired and they said, all you've got to do is uh, check the chlorine residual daily and that's pretty much it. Well, it turns out he's looking for uh, this leak and their whole system is going to be shut off without water and he doesn't even know where all of his lines are. So that could be a, definitely an unexpected challenge for sure. But luckily, we ended up finding it the next day after the city said we were going to, um, they were going to have to shut down the water. And we went and we dug up this line. Um, I don't know if you can see the gentleman down there. So I'm there on the left in the, in the hole. And then on the right hand side is a gentleman that's probably, oh, he's about, I think, in his 80s. And, and he had on just a pair of cowboy boots blue jeans and if you see see I'm wearing waders and I got all my warm clothes on and he's over here in just his cowboy boots I felt kind of like a wuss that day but he was down in that hole wet and and was working hard right on. he was tough he um they also showed me some tricks they marked the line this was just a slip joint pipe and it had separated and just pulled apart just from the freezing of the ground and uh, that's where our you know 60,000 gallons by the end 60,000 gallons a day leak was and it ended up um, being right outside of town. So in that one that shows where all the water lines, we were 
I was clear from end to end, corner to corner all the time. And then next thing we know, it's just pretty much right outside of town. Um, so we located that 60,000 gallon day leak and this just showed this, some of the savings to the district, you know, these numbers and that's all good. But, you know, if they would have potentially been shut off without water for however long, that could have been a, a way bigger issue. Um, so the water continued to flow and it's still flowing today as far as I know. Um, this is, I don't know if we saw so that. <laughs> so this is obviously a very brief uh, look at this contract. That web link at the bottom, that's this entire book, the summary report. So all the logs that have, have been, all the logs that have been uh, entered under this contract are on that, on the website there and all of the financials. So if you want more information about this contract, um, go to that web link. Um, if you want to get a hold of Jason or I, there's our information. And I don't know how we did on time, but. Uh, I think you're doing good. Um, appreciate the presentation. Um, good job, guys. Thank you. Um, what questions do we have for Jason or Darren? Either type them into the chat or you can just go ahead and open your mic and ask the question. I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> okay, I'll, I've got a couple of questions I'll ask you guys. Um, what tools do you get? Do you guys have some kind of an acoustic leak detection tool that you use to help you find the leaks? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there's, we have all kinds of equipment. And it's, um, yes, there's sounding um, equipment. We also have some that if you can get your meters onto uh, each pipe, you can tell you how much flow is going through it. That's some pretty technical stuff. I don't normally do water leak um, detection. Um, but under, you know, like, like last February, when it was extreme conditions, you know, we all do about everything at KRWA. That's the kind of the expectation. Um, but yes, I couldn't even tell you all the different types of tools that we have. But yes, sounding equipment is, uh, is one of them that we use for sure. In the rural water districts, the sound equipment is a lot harder to use because the distances are a lot further and a lot of it's plastic pot. You get into some of these towns, if you, look, if you remember that map, there was a lot of cluster up in the northeast part of the state which is where our oldest water systems are. <clears throat> and right. a lot of that's cast iron and that sounding equipment works a lot better on the cast iron. Right, We're, okay. Drones are something to be used as well so you, you can fly down the water line rather than just walking it and be able to see sometimes where there's a change in vegetation or um, a wet spot, so. Great, uh, do you guys use the AWWA um, non-revenue water loss spreadsheet to help calculate the um, water loss percentages and that sort of thing? Well, we have a form that they call the blue form and it might've originated with AWWA, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I turn the numbers in or we turn the numbers in and then I'm not sure what spreadsheet they use. There's a number that you were using, the um, retail cost of water or the, the wholesale cost of water. So sad, I yeah. think it's wholesale. It's what the system puts into the water. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Darren or Jason? All right. Thanks, guys. Good job. All right. Alex, are you ready? I am ready. Hopefully, I'll be able to... Uh share my screen. Okay, so the final presentation here is uh, entitled Soaring to New Heights with Water Reuse. Did, did, now, did you have help with that, uh, the title of your presentation? Did your PR folks get involved in that? <laughs> no, just, uh, that was just uh, what it was called, actually. Uh, um, this really isn't my um, original presentation. Uh, this was, uh, as you can see from my, uh, let's see, are you guys seeing? Oh, hang on. Yeah, we can see it, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Yeah, see, I just hit presentation mode, but it's uh, it's doing it on a, on a different screen. Hang on. Okay, I'll go ahead and introduce you while you're working on that. Yeah. So Alex Tobias is an environmental uh, regulation compliance professional with 17 years of experience. And besides past consulting work, Alex has also worked as an environmental engineer uh, for Spirit 
Aero Systems in Wichita for nine years, and more recently as a senior manager of environmental programs for Spirit globally. So his presentation is a play on words. Uh, so Spirit uh, Aero Systems has done a lot to try to help um, with their sustainability and water conservation. And Alex is going to share some information with us regarding those programs. So All right. um, looks like um, we're ready to go. Yeah, you can see the the actual presentation now. That's good. Okay. Yes. So, uh, like I was saying before, this isn't really. I'm I'm just the one who's presenting it. Really, the people who do the work are Stephen Pierce, who operates our um, our insight on site RO system, uh, John Hetherington, who is the head of our water uh, compliance program, and then Sean Bluebaugh, who is the manager over our plumbers and uh, industrial waste treatment plant and RO system here at Spirit. So, uh, Spirit is actually a, a global company. Uh, for those who don't know, we have roughly 13,000 people uh, employed globally, 11,000 in the US. Uh, this slide here actually is a bit outdated because now we have uh, facilities located in, uh, in addition to these, we have facilities located now in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and we now have uh, two MRO facilities in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> So uh, we build aero structures. If you've if you've ever flown in a seven three seven, any version of the seven three seven, you've flown in a fuselage that was built here in Wichita, Kansas, um, and. In order to build that fuselage, highly purified water is required to produce that aircraft. So. Spirit Wichita, uh, when I when I refer to Spirit here uh, in the remainder of this uh, of this presentation, I'm talking about just the Wichita facility. Uh, we use 600 million gallons of water uh, from the city of Wichita each year, and about 68 percent of that water is used for industrial purposes. And um, I'll show you some of the details in the in the in the next slides, but we recycle all of our industrial wastewater or industrial water. So here's just a rough breakdown of what what we use our water for. Uh, Forty one percent is used for our reverse osmosis system, and that feeds our um, our chemical milling tank line. Um, 31% of it is potable or sanitary water, and then 27% of it is cooling towers, and then 1% of it is groundskeeping. You think, well, wow, that's a lot. Well, you have to understand that um, that the Wichita facility is roughly one mile north to south by about a half mile east to west. So we're essentially talking about a small city here uh, just, out, just on the outskirts of Wichita towards Derby. So as I said before, we have a chemical milling processing and uh, our chemical milling capability is world class. Um, really, we're the only one in the United States that that has this scale of chemical milling, um, chemical milling processes for uh, industrial purposes. And the reason why, uh, just to give you a, a, a quick reason why we have this is, if you think about it, the, the skin that comes into our facility is just a flat piece of aluminum. Well, that flat piece of aluminum can't just be uh, tacked onto an airframe and turned into an aluminum or into an airplane skin. It has to actually have parts of it ground down um, in order to lighten it, but also strengthen it based on what stresses it's going to have when it's actually up in the air and when it has that sort of temperature and pressure cycling when it goes up to 30,000 feet and then down to zero feet again. So in order to do that, we, we use what is essentially just caustic sodium hydroxide to eat away at the certain sections of the metal. And that sodium hydroxide needs to be in a solution that uses very, very clean water in order for us to get our, our timing and our solution concentrations correct. So what feeds that system is our reverse osmosis system. And that was constructed in 1990 to con uh, support 
what we call our Manufacturing Process Facility, or MPF, building, uh, which houses all of our chemical milling uh, processes. So the RO system was reconfigured in 1996 to, in, to meet the increased demand for that process water. And then in 1998, we started reusing the treated industrial wastewater. Uh, so essentially, if we needed to dump a tank for whatever reason, or we needed to you know, change the concentration, um, that water that would normally have been wasted actually goes back to our industrial waste treatment plant. And so uh, after working out the bugs for those, for, for those two years, by the summer of 2000, Spirit Wichita was reusing our own industrial wastewater with zero discharge to the environment. So for the past 21 years, we've been a 100% recycle facility. Uh, additional, <clears throat> excuse me, additional improvements were implemented to improve the RO efficiency and output, but essentially the, the, the process is the same. So again, uh, Spirit has been a zero discharge facility since uh, 2000. Uh, in that time, roughly 17 billion gallons of water have been recycled. So that's, you can think of it in this way is that that 17 billion gallons is water that we did not have to take from the city of Wichita. And you can see in the diagram over here, um, this is essentially what it looks like in terms of our, uh, our water cycle here. <clears throat> so uh, as you can imagine, because so much water is recycled, uh, it is a cornerstone of our conservation program. Um, and here's just a couple of pictures of our uh, RO system. Uh, actually, this top one here is uh, what we call our new MSSP. And this is uh, essentially a large, um, I believe it's one of a kind in terms of scale uh, for the United States. Uh, this filtration system up here for our industrial waste treatment plant. And then, of course, you can recognize down below here, that's our RO system, uh, pretty indicative, the, the massive uh, horizontal filters there for the RO system. So the next step um, was to figure out, okay, let's reduce our demand on the city of Wichita's water even more. So we came up with the idea of the Purple Pipe Project. And uh, so the Spirit team, along with Carl Brewer, uh, met with the city of Wichita leaders and Mayor Longwell at the time, this is 2015, and we reached an agreement with the city. Uh, it's called the Purple Pipe Project for obvious reasons. The pipe that runs from uh, the city of Wichita wastewater treatment plant to us is this lovely color of purple. And I believe that the reason why it's purple is just because one of the engineers um, I think his daughter liked the color purple. And so they just decided since it didn't cost any more to get the, the, the pipe colored, they just call it purple. Uh, so our, our initial use for this idea was, uh, we, we initially planned to essentially use the, the effluent or the gray water coming off of our nearby wastewater treatment plant from the city of Wichita in our reverse osmosis system. Uh, and so we initially planned to consume roughly 1.2 million gallons of day in our reverse osmosis system with the idea that we would eventually expand it to use in our cooling towers. Um, so here is the line the actual uh, uh, line that the purple pipe took uh, straight from uh, the wastewater treatment plant number two, I believe is what it's referred to as of the city of Wichita. And uh, you can see it runs along the Ark River, uh, sort of takes a detour and then straight into our uh, Wichita facility here. And again, this isn't even the entire facility that you're looking at here in this Google Earth uh, uh, layout. Uh, our facility starts roughly here, uh, and then it extends even farther a little bit north from there as well. So here's just some pictures of the Purple Pipe Project progress. And yes, the alliteration is, uh, is intentional. Uh, so here you can see the pump and the filter house. Uh, this is 
the MPF building is in the background here. You can see uh, essentially all of our tank lines have scrubbers associated with them. And that's what you're seeing here along, uh, along the line here, all of these, uh, uh, what look like the same uh, pieces of equipment here. These are just the scrubbers and then their exhausts coming out of the top. So you're looking at uh, the west side of the MPF or manufacturing process facility. Uh, so here's the trench coming into it. And so that's basically where the purple pipe is going to end uh, going into our actual, what we consider a spirit, spirits property. So up until that point, uh, the city of Wichita owns the purple pipe, but once it actually enters at this point here, that upper right uh, picture, that's, that's where we take it over essentially. So here's just another, uh, the one on the bottom here is just another view of where the purple pipe was being laid. Uh, this is at K15 in MacArthur. So you can still see in the background, there's MPF. You can kind of see the, the top of the, of the scrubber uh, exhausts and the manufacturing process facility there in the background. So here's more, uh, more pictures of the purple pipe project pro progress. <sighs> Dang it, I was hoping I could get that every time. Uh, so here's the pumps and the filters actually going into or actually being ready to be installed uh, in the in the pump and filter house. And uh, here's the pump and filter house actually near completion. And then uh, again, that that picture that showed you here's just another view of it at K15 MacArthur. So this is the grading uh, finished after the purple pipe was actually buried out there. <clears throat> so Spirit's project goals for this purple pipe project was uh, no impact on production rates. Uh, so we could implement a, a, a cost-effective conservative solution to our water needs. Um, so Spirit essentially paid for the entirety of the, of the cost because we would see the entirety of the advantage for it. And uh, the city owns and operates the systems and it's covered under their NPDES uh, permit. And so presently we use between one and 2 million gallons of gray water from the purple pipe daily. Um, so that all, in 2020, even with our reduced um, production rates because of COVID and the fact that uh, international uh, air, airline travel and sort of uh, uh, domestic air travel really hasn't recovered yet. Uh, even with that lower usage of, or, or lower rate of production, uh, our usage last year was still 747 million gallons. So that's, you can think of it this way, that's 747 million gallons of potable water that we did not have to buy and that we did not have to use that the city of Wichita could provide elsewhere. And uh, as was mentioned in previous slides, we're currently studying the feasibility of the gray water usage in cooling towers directly. So if we get further implementation, uh, that could show another 27% uh, reduction in our facility uh, city water usage. So definitely looking forward to that. I know we're looking into, um, there, there are some issues with, with uh, the, the quality of the gray water versus what we use to treat our, um, our cooling towers as, as uh, many of you industrial uh, experts would understand uh, the biggest problem with cooling towers is making sure that they don't turn into algae or bacteria farms. And uh, yeah, it, it, using the gray water instead of potable water for it has presented some problems, but we're hopeful that in the next few years, we'll have at least our initial implementation of that uh, completed. So our long-term benefits, uh, Spirit using reclaimed gray water, uh, our potable water source savings uh, has actually met the city's 0.35% water conservation goal for the following three years after our in initial implementation of the gray water. And so uh, Spirit is very happy that we've secured a sustainable source of water that's uh, essential to uh, our aerostructures manufacturing. So relatively quick uh, presentation, um, open to any questions you may have regarding it. All right, thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, what questions do you have for Alex? Okay, Mary Hill has a question. Would Spirit be doing more manufacturing in Wichita if local water resources were considered to be more abundant? 
Well, the the it's not a matter of of water resources being more abundant in terms of of our manufacturing here. We're really more limited in um, in manufacturing space, honestly, um, um, along with other factors. So I would say that that water, while while it's definitely a factor that we have to consider when increasing our production here, it, it's not in, I would say, the top five or maybe even seven factors of, of what limits production here in Wichita. Okay. Other questions for Alex? Alex, you mentioned that um, Wichita had a water conservation goal. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Were they asking you to cut back on your potable water usage? Yes, and that was uh, back in, in 2015 when, when, uh, when this agreement was actually established. Um, back then, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly the goals are now. Um, again, this is a, a kind of an old uh, presentation that I just updated with current figures. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the city's water conservation goal is now, um, but I do know that, uh, yeah, the, the city was looking to decrease uh, water uh, usage for those next three years, and uh, we definitely helped them make that. Um, but yeah, I can't say any, uh, I can't say to what their goals are now. Hey, Mike, Alex, this is Alan King with the city of Wichita and Wayne, hey, if you like. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, that 0.35% that, uh, uh, conservation, that's ongoing, still in place today. It's not just with spirit, it's with all of our water use. And what we're doing is we're um, reducing uh, future capital expenditures by also reducing our future projected uh, water growth, water uh, demands. And that 0.35% helps us get to where we wanna be with the rates that we're charging. And so spirit came along and helped us meet those goals for three years by reducing our potable water. So it helped during those years, but, the, but those goals continue today. Okay, great. Right, thank you. Okay, Alex, you mentioned that, um, that Spirit paid for the purple pipe system. Uh, overall, have you guys been able to demonstrate a return on investment as far as the cost of all the capital versus the um, savings from buying potable water? Yes, yes, we absolutely have. And unfortunately, that's all the detail I can get into. Um, but yes, uh, we saw that it was a definitely a favorable ROI. There was a bit of an issue with, um, with us implementing this on our end of it. Um, so I believe that ROI was actually pushed back a little bit, but we're still, now that we've worked out all those kinks on our end of the purple pipe, um, we're actually seeing that it's a, a considerable cost savings. And again, so much so that we're, 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 we're looking for everywhere in the facility where we can potentially bring in more of this gray water. So yeah, like I, like I said, the next, the next, step is to see if we can put this into uh, our cooling towers, um, which we're very hopeful that it, that will happen here in the next few years. Um, and then who knows from there. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, that's a lot of equipment. The other thing I was wondering about is you have, um, uh, with the RO system, I assume that's kind of a high pressure system. What, yes, it is. What are, you, mm -hmm. what are you doing as far as your energy offsetting all the energy costs and energy demands to pump that water into the RO system? Well, um, actually it's, uh, in terms of costs, um, to be honest with you, the amount of energy that it takes to build an airplane, the RO system is a decent part of it, but it's not that significant. Mm -hmm. However, um, our electricity uh, um, costs and sustainability is actually now yeah, actually now it's uh, being offset pretty considerably because we've reached a separate agreement with Evergy. Um, we actually helped them uh, create a, a new wind farm out in Kingman County, I believe, which is just about an hour away. 
And uh, because of our uh, investment in that wind farm out there, uh, we can now declare as of, I think, September of last year. Don't quote me on that, but it, it was just recently that uh, we're essentially 100% renewable electricity here at, at uh, Spirit Wichita. That's great. What other questions are there for Alex? Alan, did you want to add anything else about the program? Uh, just to say that uh, Spirit was really good partner in this whole effort. Uh, from the city's perspective, of course, the, the spirit has to make sure that it's economically feasible for them, and it, and I think it's demonstrated that it has been. But for the city, uh, this was water that was being discharged from our sewer treatment plant, one of our five sewer treatment plants, into the river, and so there was no economic value to that water to begin with. And um, what we did was we came up with a very uh, what we think was a favorable cost per unit to. Uh, to Spirit for that water, it just really basically covered our costs and their incent the incentive for us to do that, as long as we cover the costs and there was no impact to our customers. Again, what it did is it helped us achieve for three years, our conservation uh, targets, which is all part of our long range water planning effort. So it's, I think it was a win-win. Right, that's awesome. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, we, we feel the same way. All right, good job, Alex, good presentation. Um, are there any other uh, kind of final questions for any of our presenters? All right, well, I think that wraps up uh, this session. So at this point you can return back to the, um, to the main uh, webinar.